And so we gleaned that down within 40 minutes so you can just get a kind of highlight of it. And we're going to have slides that go along with that. So we are members of the Citizens for the Preservation of Fish and Dams. And we put fish first because there's a lot of stuff going around about taking the dams out for whatever reasons. But we, we have experience and we know that if we do things properly and this puzzle gets fiddled up correctly, then we can do both. And so and my name is Dan Caldwell and uh, I worked for 13 years with uh, the dams transporting fish and doing research and so forth. And um, I do have an MS degree from Washington State University. And this is Dr. Charlie Pottinger, a retired PhD chemical engineer. He served as vice president of Potlatch Corporation, Pulp and Paper Board, responsible operation, maintenance, marketing, sales, planning in the mills in Lewiston. He's also an avid fisherman and cares a lot about the fish. Now our mission is to provide education and information regarding the preservation of fish and dams, including but not limited to the Snake River dams. And in doing so, we're going to serve many enterprises that we utilize and enjoy today, recreation, expense, inexpensive power, flood control, tourism, commodity transportation, power boat development, and irrigation. There's been a lot of stuff going around about things that happen here with well-meaning groups and individuals. A lot of it's based on opinion, emotion, speculation, and a lot of historical claims. Um, and sometimes it's just based on what's in the newspaper all the time, and um, we kind of go along with that. So today we'll be briefly discuss the many pieces of a very complex puzzle, including the history, spawning habitat, returning adult fish, dam improvements, turbines, total dissolved gas issues, hatcheries, barging, predators, and opportunities. So I'm going to turn this over now to Charlie, and when he gets through with a certain section of it, I'll come back and finish the rest of it. So thank you for us being here. Well, this is the first time I've been in a high school classroom since I graduated in 1957. <laughs> so it's, it's exciting to see. And I'm, I'm just going to try to learn how this works. I was told if I just touch this. Yeah. Anyway, our conversation about the fish is a really complex puzzle. And there's a lot of pieces to it. There's no one thing that's an answer. But there are some things that are really important. And, and I'm going to try to just give you a little history of where we uh, came from to get where we are today. If you can see in these pictures, back a long time ago, let's start someplace about 1850. The conversations that you hear from people, that there, there were millions of fish. They, they tell us that there were anywhere between 5 million. This is total salmonoids, steelhead, all Chinook, spring Chinook, sockeyes all together. Someplace between five and 15 million a year coming up the river. And they would disperse, you know, some of them came up to Snake and some of them went up to Columbia. About the middle 1800s, technology was developed to be able to catch fish and can them and then you could ship them all over the world and sell them as food. And you can just still do that today. You can go down to grocery stores and buy canned salmon. At the peak of the, of the canning, back in the middle of the 1800s, they were, they were, there was a whole bunch of canners. We, we say in here 53. They were canning someplace between 43 and 46 million pounds of fish a year. That's a lot of fish. And the, uh, and then you know, some of these brands are here, you can still see it. What well, we did to the whole streams network which includes the Columbia River all the way up into Canada and the Snake River all the way down to uh, the first impenetrable falls which is way upstream from Boise. All of that used to be available for spawning for the salmon and the steelhead and the as we, we developed logging came into big a big business out here in the west 
in the late 1800s and, and in the early 1900s and, and today. And, but when we first started doing this, we were, we were building roads and railroads, and we weren't paying attention. People were, probably more than you and me, it was all of us. We didn't, we didn't, when we come to a small stream, we had to build a road across it was we'd put a culvert in and the culvert might be designed in such a way like this one, but a fish can't jump it up, Oop, but anyway. Then uh, more logging, we, we, used to, we used to do the big log drives on the Clearwater River, they'd come down to North Fork and, and push those logs all the way to Lewiston. And it was a wonderful way to do it, and a lot of, a lot of historical lore but it scoured out the bottoms of the rivers and it, it damaged places where fish used to spawn. And all of this activity was dra dragging logs down the river, building dams and flooding the rivers and flushing them real fast, which is what we used to do. The log drives, all of that ended up with spawning area being destroyed. And, and there's a picture of the last log drive. Then in, in about 1860, they discovered gold up around Pierce. And we had a mini gold rush up here. It was a big deal. And it caused more damage to the stream because people were doing, building sluices in places where the fish used to go. And then after that happened, when once the little, log, little gold seekers got out of the way, then we had big dredges come up these rivers, and a lot of the rivers you go up, up towards Dixie, I mean, they just went through the whole river. I mean, they went every place with those dredges. And so the discovery of gold really put the icing on the cake for where, now we're still back in the 1800s, early 1900s, see? And all of that damage destroyed a lot of fish habitat and the canneries were taking huge numbers of fish. So the decline of the fish started in the middle of the 1800s. And by the time we got to, let's say, 1930, the decline stopped. And that's what they don't tell you about today. You know, the decline is not ongoing. They like you to think it is. This is the data from 1938 I'm going to use my cane because that's about all I'm good for anymore. <laughs> but the, 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 over here on this side of the graph is 1938. And that's when we built Bonneville Dam. Had a fish ladder. Had a window. And they started counting fish in 1938, and we've counted them every year since. And this graph shows salmon is the red line, and the green line is steelhead, and uh, uh, we don't have the sockeye and all that stuff in there, but that's this just as an indication. These are the fish that, that as a guy who likes to go fishing, get, I, like the, I like the Chinook salmon and I like steelhead. They're the most important fish to me. But, and they're, they're important to everybody, but they're wonderful. From 1938 until 1999, there's lots of variation. That's that puzzle I've been talking about. It's a big puzzle. There's lots of things that happen. But there's no, you don't see any just continuing downward trending number of fish coming up the river. From 1938 till 1947, when they built the, the uh, first, uh, the second dam on the river, the number of the fish coming up the river is relatively constant, sort of like this, right across. I don't know how you go backwards. I'm, I guess I'm out of Oh, sorry. I touched the screen accidentally. <laughs> All right. I just go. got a few more things to say about this graph. This graph is in my mind, it should be in everybody's mind that wants to talk about the fish. Because we're talking about taking out four dams that really have nothing to do with the declining of the fish. The fish had been uh, destroyed up to whatever, whatever the right word is. Prior to building any dams on the river, the, the fish count had dropped down to dismal levels. And they're still, we're still getting a couple million fish a year. But what happened is 
from, from 1938 to 1947. We didn't have any more dams on the river. And then something happened over here. You see what happened here in, in 2000. All of a sudden, after, after all those years, we have an explosion of fish coming up the river. Okay? And we think we have one of the key factors. We're going to talk about it here a little bit. So try to remember that. There's no change in the number of fish. This is prime Chinook salmon and uh, steelhead. From the beginning of the first account we ever had, and, and you know, people talk about the millions a long time ago, nobody knows how many millions of fish there really was. We all, I think we all could agree there were a lot more then than there is now. Okay. Here's a little table that shows that if this is for steelhead, and over here I got the salmon. And for steelhead, for the first 10 years, when there was no dam except one of them, we had, we had an average of 127,453 steel in a year. That, that's, that, that's not very many. And then in, from, and then we go back to that hump in my graph. From 2000 until 2009, we've got 401,440 average. And that's more than three times as many. So, you know, something happened. You had 60, 70 years with nothing happening. And then all of a sudden we have this big explosion of fish. Same thing happened with the salmon. We had 61,000 from 38 to 47, 10 years. 61,000 uh, salmon. And, and from 2000 to 2009, we were getting 163,400. So we're getting a lot more fish. Something happened. And that's what we're talking about. And the dams back in this period from, from uh, 38 to 47, one dam. 2000 to 2009, we got eight dams that were all built. To, as the dams were built, the number of fish didn't drop off. That's important to know. It's super important to understand that the dams haven't caused the decline in the fish. None of the dams with fish ladders. So let's talk about something else. See, in in the uh, in the years that we've lived since 1938, we've built dams without fish ladders. Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph Dam on the main stream of the Columbia River. They blocked off a thousand miles potentially of mainstream river upstream of those dams, and they blocked it. They completely made it impossible for any fish to go up. No fish ladder. Then to top it all off, we built Brownlee, Hell's Canyon, and Oxbow dams on the Snake River down here, and we cut off a thousand miles of. Snake River, the Weezer River, the Payette River, all those beautiful, wonderful places that they say are the most productive salmon spawning grounds anywhere in the world. And we blocked them off. And that was in, in the 1960s, we built those dams. And then we built, to cop it all off, we built Dorshak Dam, and we locked up the most fertile parts of the Clearwater River drainage from, from a fish spawning habitat area. We lost between 55 and 80 percent of the spawning area that used to be available, available to stamp and steelhead because we built these dams without fish ladders. And everybody's going to try to take out four dams with fish ladders, which don't have any effect on the number of fish. And they say they hope that'll let us get back to more fish in the future, just taking those dams out. That's what we think is not true. Gorshek Dam, the Hell's Canyon Complex, Grand Coulee Dam, and then we top it all off with all these culprits that we put in that block small streams and limit the, the, the spawning habitat. If the fish don't have a place to spawn, they can't. 
And of course, we've, we've augmented that with fish hatcheries, which is wonderful thing. I'm all for it. But the combination of effects have eliminated all of this habitat. And so without the habitat, they don't have any chance of, of uh, going. Go Did I do two? Yeah. So which one is it? This I one? I got it. I got it. Okay. You're... Somehow. Okay. Okay, now we just go one. There. So in 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 the in the years from from 2000 to 2009, and then even on up to 2015, we had that huge spike in the graph with fish coming back. And what were we doing? We had worked from 1977 up until 2000 on perfecting the technology of transporting fish down the river with barges. And eventually we finally got the, the combination. We don't know if it's right, because you know, if, if we can continue barging at a maximum number, we can improve that technology. But they eventually put in uh, devices to remove total dissolved gas from the, that's what, that's what the dams do to harm the smolts is they generate a high level of total dissolved gas, which gives you, gives the fish something like nitrogen bends in the, when they go down the river. So we had maximum barging from, the, from 2000 to 2009, 2015. And what we what we learned is that if we if we use these high techno barging techniques that we know how to do, that 98 percent plus 98 percent plus of the smokes from Lower Granite arrive at downstream of Bonneville alive if they're in the barge. If they put them over the dams like they're doing right now, this is what they this is the the. Uh, uh, technology that they're pushing spill instead of transport, 50% of the fish die when you put them over the dams. The, they, they, they quote numbers anywhere from 40 to 60. I just made it 50. So we're back to this graph. Do we want this or do we want this? And we have one piece of the puzzle that we know we, you, you can't get rid of the variability because you got, oh, if I, well, you got to wash your hand, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can't uh, get away from the variability because you got ocean conditions, you got predators, you got fishermen, you got people gill netting, and all these things affect the number of fish that get back up here. But if, if a fish starts up the Snake River, and a lot of them do, they make it over the dams. They get up just fine. One of the things we've learned is that barging is an important piece of this puzzle. And uh, spawning habitat is a real key to the future. So I, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, uh, Dan now. Dan worked all those years on, on the barges, and he knows about how they get the little babies down the river. Thanks, Charlie. 